A few months ago, someone sent me a video of the 10 most dangerous airports in the world. Obviously, I was interested. So I started watching it and realized that every airport in there, the ideas and their explanations of why it was dangerous made no sense at all. But the video got so long, I decided I was going to have to do a part two. This is the part two. Now, you don't have to watch the part one. It doesn't need to be in any specific order. And a lot of people were asking me in the comment section of the last video, uh, what are you calling this series? Because it seems like every video that I'm doing now has some type of a series in it. I hadn't come up with it. There was a bunch of different ideas and uh, YouTuber takes on aviation fear monger. It didn't really seem to fit. It seemed to be too long. So I don't really have a name for this series. And by the way, a fear monger is someone who tries to make people afraid of something intentionally when it's not rational or reasonable. So since I don't have a name for this series yet, Pilot versus Aviation Fearmonger, coming up. Hey 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel 74 Gear is all about aviation. I appreciate all of you in the 74 crew and those of you who've been sending me videos, sending me memes, sending me things that you want to see on these different series. I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. You already know what this video is about, so let's get into it. Paro Airport. This airport is so dangerous that there are only eight pilots in the world who are qualified to land there. The runway is surrounded by mountain peaks that are 18,044 feet high. To make matters worse, the runway is only 6,499 feet long. Because airplanes need to make such a quick descent to get to the strip, only the best of the best can land or take off from this airport. Only the best of the best can take off and land at that airport. Okay. You heard him talk about there only being eight qualified pilots to go in there. Is so dangerous that there are only eight pilots in the world who are qualified to land there. What will happen in a very complex airport is the airlines will have specific training that they do for pilots to go in there. We have the same thing in the US. There are some airports that require special simulator training in order to be qualified to go in there and qualified in case there is an engine failure procedure. And instead of having, let's say you have 200 pilots and training all those 200 pilots to be able to do that specific airport, which requires specific simulator training, instead of training all 200 pilots, most airlines pick a small group of people who are going to fly that all the time. That's the only thing that they fly. That's probably why they only have eight people that are doing it and not a large group of people. In the US, the ones that come to mind, I think it's Aspen. I think that's the airport. Uh, I knew an airline that was flying into Aspen all the time. They had a small group of pilots that were trained specifically to fly that Aspen run. Or maybe it was Vail. I don't remember but it was something in the mountains there. It was specific training that you had to do for that specific airport. There was simulator training and other training that you had to do. So instead of them training their 3,000 pilots of all how to fly in there and keeping everybody available and trained in case that needs to happen, they had a small group of people who that's all that they did. I'm guessing that's the exact same thing for this airport here. Next, they're talking about these large mountains and how they're going to have to make a quick descent to get onto the runway. I don't know, it's always this quick descent with this guy. You're not going to believe it, but my airline, surprisingly, has this arrival chart for that particular airport. I didn't think it was going to be here, but here it is. So this symbol right here shows you the highest peak on the chart, 15,538 feet. And hey, that's very high. Although it would be also good to note that the airport itself is at an altitude of 7,364 feet. So it's really only a difference of a little over 8,000 feet. Now I'm not saying this isn't a high risk airport. I agree that there's special qualifications and challenges that there would be to be going into this particular airport, but it's not as dramatic as this guy's making it sound. An airport a lot of you are familiar with is Los Angeles, LAX. Take a look at this one. Here's an arrival chart to LAX. I've flown this arrival before. See this same symbol here? That's showing the highest point on this chart, 8,813 feet. So that's actually a few hundred feet higher when you compare it to the airport than Paro Airport. By using these large peaks that they're using in this video here, 
They're trying to make it sound like it's this very scary, massive difference, when in reality, here's LAX, an airport that some of you have probably flown into. Everybody has seen it. It's a massive airport. Now, I'm not saying flying into Pero and flying into LAX are the same and equal difficulty. No, I'm sure flying in here is more difficult, and there's definitely some more things to be concerned about because you're flying through a mountain valley. I'm not saying that they're equal in risk, but I'm just saying the point that they're using is this huge difference, and the reality is, is on this arrival coming into LAX, you have kind of the same thing as far as altitude differences. Now on this chart here at Pero, it looks like from this point here, you'd have to follow this valley straight into the airport. This is the airport right here. And you'd have to descend all 9,000 feet before you got to the airport here, which is not a lot. That's a totally reasonable amount of time to descend from that point until the airport. That's not really that big of a deal. And the length of the runway is long enough that you could land a 747 in there. It would be a very tight landing, but you could still make it fit. So if I can land a 747 in that landing distance, then you should be able to land any small Airbus A320 or 319 or whatever, or a Boeing 737. You should be able to land either of those two in there with no problems at all. Gibraltar International this airport is not dangerous because of a short runway or a location inside of the mountains. It is dangerous because the runway actually intersects a main street, Winston Churchill Avenue. When a plane needs to land, the road is closed. There are not people blocking off the street. There is just one stoplight to warn drivers to stop for an airplane. Because there isn't much to stop drivers, there have been plenty of close calls over the years. It feels like they're grasping at straws trying to come up for airports that could be dangerous, which don't make any sense. Kind of like the Hollywood movies, you could have just asked a pilot, and a pilot probably could have come up with 10 airports that could be dangerous with something that was logical and made sense. Is it possible that you could get a bunch of drunk people in a car and that they go around the red light or whatever that's blocking the airport there and drive onto the middle of the runway? Yeah, it's possible. But if that were happening all the times and planes were getting destroyed during landings, uh, airplanes probably wouldn't be flying in there because planes are expensive, so they're not going to be having crashes all the time. So is this happening a lot? No. Is it something you should be scared of? Also, no. The reality is, is that if you're in a plane and you were to hit one of these small cars, European cars tend to be a lot smaller than American cars, if you were to hit one of these small European cars and you're in a large aircraft, those people in the car are going to be in a lot of trouble. It's going to be uncomfortable for you in the plane you will probably have to evacuate the aircraft, but you're probably not going to be in any life-threatening danger for the most part. Could be, but probably not. And again, if that were happening all the time, the airlines wouldn't be flying there. The real danger if you go to Gibraltar is actually getting into a car and then getting some driver who drives onto the runway during landing. That's the biggest risk. McMurdo Air Station People don't visit Antarctica often. Therefore, the McMurdo Air Station doesn't have the best of safety conditions. The runway is a pretty good length. However, since it is freezing there all year long, the runway is usually covered with slick ice. Since it is dark there for most months of the year, the pilots who land need to wear night vision goggles so that they can see where they're going. It's dark for most parts of the month. Now, don't tell this to a flat earth person, but it's six months of light and six months of dark. So that's how it works down there in Antarctica. So as long as six months is most, then yes. The other thing that I found funny is talking about landing on the runway and the ice being slick. I mean, is that opposed to the normal grippy ice that you otherwise land on? The runway is usually covered with slick ice. Here's the thing. I've landed a plane on ice and snow in a snowstorm, and I've done a bunch of different bad weather. Now, if you gave me the option of a, a clear, blue, dry day without wind, yeah, I'd rather take that. But the momentum of your aircraft when you land on something that's snow or ice is going down the middle of the runway, which means if you've lined up your aircraft properly as you come in to land, that momentum is going to be going that same direction. You're not going to be like a car going around a bend or anything like that. You're going straight and that's a lot of momentum. So if, as long as you set it in correctly, you're going to be fine. And if your aircraft does start to skid, it's not like there's a bunch of things around you that you're going to hit into. It looks like a very wide runway and a very long runway. So even if you skid and started going down the runway skidding, 
it's not going to be a big deal. You're not going to slam on your brakes. It looks like you have plenty of distance. And luckily, luckily, they haven't put the runway next to the end of the earth, flat earthers. And since I brought that up, the flat earth thing, uh, I get asked about the update for that. I haven't seen or heard of them organize anything. I actually did get carbon copied an email from somebody requesting a charter and asking if I would be involved in flying it, but it was going to an airline. So I'm not going to organize for all the flat earthers out there. I'm not going to organize the flight for you and get all the pricing. I'm not selling this as a package transport deal. If you all want to organize it, you guys can get the pricing. If you want to request me to fly it and if I'm available, I'll fly it. That's how it's going to work. I'm not going to do all the legwork for you. I'm not going to waste my time. Back to Antarctica, the alternative to get there, if you ever do want to go there, is by boat. Now, I know a girl who went there and she went on a boat. She said it was like three days of really rough seas. People were throwing up all over the place. So uh, if I'm going to compare a plane landing on ice or a boat and rough seas for several days, I'll choose a plane every single day. Daytime or nighttime, depending on the time of year, it doesn't matter. Now, all of you know I don't really like cold weather, but I would like to go to Antarctica because I'd like to say I've been to all seven continents. That would be really cool. So if you're some hot female scientist down there who has a nice warm room with a huge supply of hot cocoa, I can come down there and edit videos for a few days. Invite me down. Madeira Airport. This is one of the only airports in the world whose runway was built by engineers. The landing strip has steep cliffs on one side and the ocean on the other. In order to expand the runway, they had to build the extension on over 180 columns. These columns must be able to withstand the heavy shock that airplanes produce during landing. If an airplane comes in too hard, the runway could collapse. So far, it hasn't happened. However, over time, the columns will weaken. Without proper upkeep, an accident is definitely possible. Getting a bit fast and loose with the word cliff, aren't we? This is not a cliff. This is a cliff. You're not going to believe this, but I actually have a chart for this airport as well. Some of the charts that we have are airports I think I'll never ever fly to, but it's cool that it's in here. Let's take a look at this. This is the runway here, and you can see this gradual climb up in the hillside, which they're calling a cliff. So if your pilot was so bad that they missed the runway and ended up all the way over here on this hill, well, it doesn't really matter because if they missed the runway by that much, you could be out in the middle of the desert and it would still be an equally terrible problem. I have joked about being off center line when you're landing on a runway. I've joked about that. I had a problem with it when I went through flight school. For some reason, I'd always land on the left or the right and I don't remember which one it was, but I've joked about that, but I've never ever seen a professional pilot go to land and completely miss the runway so much that they're all the way off outside of the airport, which is what it would take in this case to miss the runway and land on the hill that they're calling a cliff. You'd have to get all the way off the airport field. Not likely. And then I found this part really funny. If an airplane comes in too hard, the runway could collapse. Is it possible for a plane to land so hard that it collapses the columns? Yeah, I guess it's possible. But if a plane were to land so hard that it were to collapse the columns there, you'd probably also collapse the landing gear, pancake the entire plane, and do a bunch of other things. Now, you've seen in some of my viral debriefs how hard of a landing these planes can take, and they just bounce right back up or whatever they do. And so if that's the case, you have other problems to worry about. I wouldn't really worry about these columns collapsing. And then there's this thing that they said. Without proper upkeep, an accident is definitely possible. I mean, what does definitely possible even mean? I mean, is it definitely possible that a bunch of Victoria's Secret models got lost on their bus ride to their show and they ended up at one of my pool parties? I mean, that's definitely possible. Narsarswak Airport. This is one of the most dangerous airports in the world for a few reasons. The environment is what makes this airport so dangerous. The runway is always covered with ice. If an airplane comes in fast on the ice, it's not uncommon for the plane to go off into the snowbanks. Because there is almost always a storm, it can be very difficult for the pilot to see where they're landing. Diminished visibility makes landing at this airport very dangerous. To make matters worse, nearby is an active volcano which erupts often. The ash can stall and even destroy a plane's engines. 
this can result in a deadly crash. This airport is so dangerous that many pilots refused to fly in or out of this airport. The airport is always covered in ice. The runway is always covered with ice. This doesn't look like ice, or this, or this one. And then he said if the plane comes in really fast, it could slide off the end of the runway. Well, that could be true on even no ice. And that's why we don't come in way over the speed that we're scheduled to come in and land at for that exact reason. So that makes no sense at all. But he did get something right when he said this. The ash can stall and even destroy a plane's engines. The volcanic ash, if it were to get into the engines of your aircraft, is very dangerous. There's a really famous story about a British Airways aircraft, a 747, that flew through a volcanic ash, I want to say in the 80s, and they lost all four engines for a short time. And if you hear the captain's transmissions or whoever the pilot was that made those transmissions, the dude is so, so cool. Now, I'll be honest, if I lost all four engines and didn't know why, I would be very, very nervous. But that was the 80s before they have all the technology that they have now. I've flown around volcanic ash before as recently as the last 12 months. What happens is if a volcano were to erupt, we get sent a message, imagine like a text message to our aircraft. It can come from air traffic control, it can come from our airline. There are people at the airlines that are watching your flight and if there were something to impede that flight or make it dangerous or whatever, those people, those flight watchers, will send a message, a text message to the crew and let them know, hey, listen, there's volcanic ash that's on your route of flight and it's gonna be in this area here at this altitude. So we'll get that message. We'll take that message, we'll map out where we're flying, and then we'll see if we're gonna be impacted by that in any way. And you can ask that person that sent that message, is this on a route of flight? What do you suggest? And get their information because they'll have more live information than obviously you'll have in flight there. So is that something that would be a risk flying through volcanic ash? Yes. Is that a risk in today's aviation? No, because the technology allows for us to make phone calls or phone calls to us or messages or any of those things. So if there were to be something that were to happen and we would be five minutes away from it, we could get a message right away. They could say, call us. We could call them. And they could tell us, go to this altitude or go to this direction. And they'll come up with a plan to keep you away from it. So while it is a risk, it's not a risk in today's aviation. As for the whole refuse to fly to that airport part? This airport is so dangerous that many pilots refused to fly in or out of this airport. I have seen situations where pilots can refuse to go to a high-risk environment. For example, my airline flies to Afghanistan. That's currently a war zone. So pilots can say, I don't want to fly into a war zone. I have seen that. But otherwise, if your airline flies to that airport all the time, you can't just say like, I don't want to do that airport and this airport and that airport. I don't like those. They don't feel good to me. I don't want to go there. That's not how it works. Your airline flies to that place and then you're going to fly to that place. That's how it works. Cliff Landing This is not a traditional airport. It is a place where an airplane was forced to make an emergency landing. Luckily, the plane stopped before it went off the cliff. It takes a very skilled pilot to perform such a feat. I was very confused when I saw this, so I googled it, and then this is the first image that comes up. This is a plane, I think it's in Turkey, they skidded off the end of the runway and then slid over to the side here, and then their plane stopped here before going into the water. So if you're the narrator of this video, or whoever wrote this script, and this to you makes someone a very skilled pilot to skid off of a runway and then have gravity and friction stop a plane from going into the water, then what does that make me? If you want to see part one of this video, check it out right here. And if you want to see some pilots making some actual dumb decisions, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the flip side up.